and welcome to ISU Redbirds podcast, episode three. Um, we'll have a problem once we get past five, but we'll deal with that at that moment. Uh, so today we have, we're going to be talking about the Valley Tournament and the difference between what it's been for about the last 20 years, where we have two teams playing on Sundays and eight on Fridays. And so John will be kicking us off with that. Uh, I have a show and tell item and then our special guest, Gerard Coleman, a man I played with. All right. So here we are, episode three, talking about the Valley. Okay. So... As uh, John said, over the past year, we sort of learned some new information about what's going to happen in the Missouri Valley. We learned that uh, the Loyola Chicago Ramblers were leaving the Valley, going to the A-10, and we were getting three new teams. We're getting the UIC Flames, the Belmont Bruins, and the Murray State Racers. Um, so that obviously leads to a, a big difference in the Valley and how the tournament plays out. We're going to have, you know, 12 teams in the in the Valley Tournament. And uh, I think that actually turns out to to look a little bit different. I, I drew up a, um, what the bracket looks like, and I think I think what's going to happen is on Thursday we're going to be having um, four um, we're going to be having four games um, now instead of the two games that we used to have, um, and that'll lead into. Uh, uh, the four winners of those games would lead into Friday of having uh, four other games with the uh, top four seeded teams. And, uh, you know, that's just going to make it that much more important to get into the top four um, during the regular season. So, uh, yeah, I guess you, I'll just, you sort just of, go ahead. I'll, I'll kick no, it over that, to John yeah, and Steve. To, to, yeah, that, that's to, perfect. Um, yeah, you're going to really struggle with legs, right? I mean, you can start to see the three-point percentage start to drop, even on those teams that play Saturday, Friday, currently today, play Friday, and then come back on Saturday. Their three-point percentage and their field goal percentage drops by about five to six percentage points. Um, and then on Sunday, you see it even drop a little more, right? Most teams are shooting low 40s on that Sunday with legs. Um my day and age, right, we played two. We had Drake on Friday night, came back and played Creighton um, in an absolute dogfight in Redbird Arena. And But we had a day off for the championship. So we had a rest day. You know, we got around and did a little shoot around in the morning and did our stretching. But then, you know, we were all uh, um, back in our dorms rooms and going to bed early. So the next day, and then we did another shoot around on, on Monday. So... Ours was a lot different, right? And so, Steve, I, I, you know, I, so it's going to be interesting. Yeah, so so the, the, the first and most obvious thing is uh, in the past, getting the fourth seed or the fifth seed didn't matter except for just what color didn't jersey matter. you wore, okay? You, you still played, uh, you know, the 1-8 winner, you know, so you finished four, you finished five. Big difference now, right? You're going to have to show up on Thursday and, and, and play. Um, if you look at the history of, of the, the people play on, on Thursday night, okay, especially with the format now, which is Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you know, there's only been, I think, three teams that actually won on Friday. And, and then, you know, some of that's because obviously there's seven, eight, nine, ten teams that are they're, they're the bottom of the conference. But some of it's just what you're talking about as well, John. And you'll probably have a little bit more, you know, from a fifth seed or a sixth seed. They'll probably have a little bit more success, but when you start hitting Saturday and you start hitting uh, Sunday, it, it's obviously going to be impactful. And I think it's, we were down there. What was it? Uh, 2020, when Ben Velpel actually made it to the championship game, and you could tell they were gassed, especially in the, guess, in the second yeah. half. Yeah. Well, and look at this. And I think it was 20. And somebody have to go back and do a double check on me. Wasn't Bradley a five seed when they won it in 19 and when they won it in 20? They weren't in the top. We'll have to check that and confirm. We'll put they, that They were up. definitely in the, the one year, they were definitely in the four or five game. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and so if you're that five seed this time, right, where Bradley won the Valley Championship um, and because of COVID didn't get the chance to go and play the NCAA tournament, that five seed is a huge different than having a sh legitimate shot to win it. Um, today, even the sixth seed has a legitimate shot to win it in the Valley. Um, so besides so now, the brackets, there, there's some other things we got to talk about, here, the changes, right? First of all, Loyola is gone, right? So no more scarves, 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no Harry Potter scars. Harry Potter's gone. Harry, Harry, Harry. Potter's going to be gone. Their pretentious uh, 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 um, fans will be gone. You know, and we're, you know we're bringing in uh, uh, you know two uh, public schools, uh, one private school. Um, I think you know my daughter went to Murray State, and, and that is a basketball first school. So you know, I think similar to like some of the other Valley schools, um, you know, Loyola obviously became a basketball uh, school or, or you know a couple of years. But if the same amount of success was happening at Illinois State, at Bradley, okay. Missouri State, Southern Illinois, the fans would just be packed, you know, all, right. all, all three days. Definitely. You know, they, they would mosey down, you know, a little bit Friday, Saturday, a little bit more loyal fans. And then by Sunday, hey, we made it for the championship game. Right. And, and uh, um, you're going to see fans that are very passionate. And I'm not saying it's going to be like uh, Wichita State because it, that, that passion will be there. The yeah. size probably won't be quite as much because you know, the one thing with Wichita is – it's in a bigger community, right? So not only are you drawing the school and alumni, you're drawing that 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 Fan base. community as well. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think the other thing, you, you know, UIC. I mean, that's gonna be interesting, right? There, a lot of commuter school, but a and lot of it, alumni. Yeah, a lot of alumni. And you guys have gone to games since. You know, in the last five or seven years, whenever we've played up there, how is the how many how many fans do they get in the UIC Pavilion these days when they're having a game? What's their when like the last time we when was the last time we played? Oh, like I played two it, years you know, ago. Year, right? Yeah, I mean, it's not big. I mean, they they yeah. draw. A couple but how many fans, fans do they fans? get? Two to three thousand fans. Yeah, and, you know that. It's not much, and some of those are Illinois State fans sitting in there. They probably draw more for our, <laughs> our games than others. Um, but, you know, and I, th that's... I think when Collins coached them, right, and they had some success, you know, they drew a little bit better. But it's it's not going to be like you know some of the other Missouri Valley. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So again, I fly in on Wednesdays, anyways, right? Uh, American out of Phoenix, and so I'm already there, so it doesn't bother me. I get to see more games, and so I just hope ISU was playing on Friday. Uh, I never like to see him playing on my Thursday because I know ultimately what's going to happen. Um, I'd rather be watching ISU than any of the other Valley teams, but if they're not in it, I can still enjoy basketball. So, all right. Well, well I mean, I think that's another good point, right? We get to see two more games on that's Thursday. That's true. Yeah, and, you know, yeah, yeah. And, that means you two are going to have to take off all day on Thursday right. and meet me right. on Friday totally or Wednesday. That. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we sit in... The oh my god, uh, where do we sit at? Uh, what's our hotel? Oh, Drury Inn. Drury Inn. Yeah. So last year we started watching games on. We watched the um, the Paul game, and then we watched the uh, Tennessee game. So yeah, and so we'll have different games on this year and uh, on that Wednesday night and then that Saturday night. So all right, so we're gonna move on. Um, as we get ready for our special guest, my show and tell this week is my ISU shirty shooting shirt from the mid '80s. This is probably '88, '89. Now, so, so, I was, so Pam, yeah. er, who's Pam Erton? <laughs> yeah, the the B kind of uh, started falling off. You can see the B is still there. Now, the reason I have this shirt is because wait, did you, wait, did you give that to Brooke when she was born? The B. No, no, no yeah. I'm Good. Up in her room and stuff like that, that. That's that's a great joke. You know, don't quit your day job because your family's going to starve to death. But yeah. So I was talking to Coleman, my boy. Thank you for the drum roll, John. Engineer John Diner doing his job. And Drog's like, hey, I got my shooting shirt. So we were talking last Monday, and our 90 minutes into it, he, I'm like, okay, I got my shooting shirt. Today he texts me, oh, big pimp, I can't find my shooting shirt. So we'll see if he has it. Um, and uh, so we're going to go to break. So, Mr. Engineer, do your job. We have my bookend from college, 68225 from North Chicago, Gerard Coleman, number 52. Uh, it's kind of funny. You know, Coach had big Rick Lamb and big Hank the Tank, and they were 52 and 53. And then... 
here's Gerard. I was a, a redshirt freshman, and here comes Gerard, and he becomes 52, and I'm 53. And then a lot of times we were watching videos together and doing all these post stuff. So here is my brother from another mother, Mr. Gerard Coleman. How hey, you doing, big boy? Great to be here, man. Great to hang out with you guys. I had actually, we were talking earlier, I was looking forward to this day, man. I'm like, damn, I'm a little tired. Let me take a nap or something real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully I can think clearly and John doesn't ask me a bunch of hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, it was my job to do the hard things like screen for you. I got to watch you score 1,300 plus points. So, yeah, we did this. We did it together, man. I mean, Gerard in, in the Michigan game, 16 points, 10 rebounds, right? And, you know, we out rebounded Michigan. We did that through hard work with Big Scotty Fowler and Sonny and, and the four of us, right? And so, okay. You gave us a list of things, and I'm going to so give you a nice soft pitch right back. You gave right. us the DePaul game. I'm not allowed to complain about it, but I'm hoping <laughs> you can help me. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm almost <laughs> now that he's bringing it up, um, I remember it being a really ugly game, as you, as you should be able to remember, too. What was the score like? The score was in the 40s all the way until like the last, what, the last minute or so. Uh, it, was we, it, was ugly, it was a weird, ugly game, man. But, you know, again, the only thing, I can't even hardly remember the course of the game until that last shot. And yep. that's the only, that's the biggest memory of that. I mean, you do the replay of that. I can understand that this guy is was on the line and they're confused about what to call but this guy was I mean it was like what a bus shoot with three points I mean yeah. this guy was like a foot inside the line he throws it up there and the referee I'm thinking okay wow we're going to overtime we'll beat him there man and he threw his hands up man and ran out of the gym like somebody was shooting at him <laughs> <laughs> out of the gym. this dude knows he blows that man he blew that call so Oh God! Yes, that's, that's yes. all I can remember about that, and I and I reflect on that a lot still. So I missed two free throws late in that game, and uh, I still to this day I tell these two once a year I'll wake up in the middle of the night on that free throw line missing those damn shots again. Right? That's the only play I have regret for my career. So you know, yeah, for, for those that don't ahead. remember that, that that was the last game. That was the last game in Horton Fieldhouse, right? Was that the last no. game? It's the it's the second last game in Horton Fieldhouse because oh, you and I played in the last game at Fort Horton Fieldhouse against Butler. Yeah. Was, we're down yeah. twenty and came back and oh, won. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And so I really blame the construction crew that didn't finish Redbird on <laughs> time. <laughs> All right, so let's keep going, big man. Okay. You want to talk? Let's talk about the Southern Illinois game, Valley Championship. Oh my God! Yeah, let me see. What? Where can I start at? You know what? I tell this story to other people. Um, the one of the first things that I mentioned to them was the fact that people. I still can't believe to this day that people were, were buying tickets to stand in the bowl to watch that game. And then it was so loud that the refs had to keep blowing the whistle at times to stop the play. That was crazy, man. Um, for me personally, I was already really pissed because Southern had beat us <laughs> um, <laughs> for that second meeting. And I remember telling Elvin, our teammate Elvin, I said, Elvin, I can't wait to play them again. Um, I didn't have a great offensive game uh, during that time. The, yeah, that second meet. I didn't have a great offensive game. We were playing down in Southern. And it just, it was one of those games, again, where it was kind of an ugly game, man, and they managed to squeak out a win. And I was really, for whatever reason, that particular well, game, I was really pissed that we lost it. And remember, we don't have Ricky for that game, right? Yeah. Because his mom was battling cancer and it was coming to the end. And so 
um, he came to us as a team and said, listen, I really want to go home and see your mom. And we were like, yeah, we got your back. Go. And again, like you, I, I felt bad for losing that game because we were supposed to have Ricky's back. And, you know, he's going up to be with his mom for her final yeah. days. And yeah. And so. Um, but yeah, talk about the how loud was it at? I want to hear you talk about how loud Horton was for those some of those games versus how loud Redbird was. Um, I'll pick a couple of games to reflect on that. When we will play Bradley. And you remember our sophomore year um, when we played Purdue. And Purdue beat us, what, like by three points. They were picked to go to the Final Four that year, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think they ended up losing a little bit earlier in the tournament. But yeah, we played them tough. And um, I remember that game. It was one of those games, again, where, you know, the people get into it, man, and they're cheering, and you can't hear the refs. And you have to... It's so hard to describe. You have to experience that craziness. You know, but... Yeah, Horton, maybe because Horton was so small, that's what made it so loud. I mean, the arena was nice, don't get me wrong. You know, nice place to play, you know, houses, houses a bunch of people, but it's nothing like Horton. Horton still is the, the best place place to play in. So, yeah. Yeah, we had hand signals. We'd grab each other by the jersey to yell in yeah. each other's ears. And it just rattled your chest sometimes when the yeah. student section would start Pouncing their pounding their feet, and I can remember looking up, thinking, "Oh my God, the ceiling's going to come in." Or <laughs> looking, looking up the north end zone, going, "What if those things collapse and all those right. people die?" Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you'd be on the court thinking that. Yeah. And practice anyway. <laughs> Rough the fly drills. The whole field comes out and put the care. Man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, now go to the the Valley Championship game. So you talked about the Southern game, the uh, one of our almost our second to last conference game. Now we fast forward into the Valley Tournament. You know what? That was a heck of an experience all the way from the first game. You remember we beat Drake first. Yep. And I reflect on the um, – I'll go back to – when we had the conference tournament before the season, not the conference tournament, I'm sorry. You remember those banquets that we would go to before the season started? That, uh, you remember we went to, uh, yeah, the four so of we us, went our, down. our senior year, the four of us went to St. Uh, Louis. Yeah, I think it might yeah. be St. Louis. Yeah. So it was, we yep. We were all there, and I remember talking to Sam Roark. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was talking to Sam Roark. You know, we're just, you know, shooting the shit a little bit, man. And, you know, talking about uh, uh, what our plans were for the season. I said, dude, this is our last go around, man. You know, what What do you plan on doing? He said, as soon as we lose our last game, I will be 300 pounds within two weeks. That was, <laughs> 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 that was great. He said, I'm so tired of basketball, man. So I can imagine he just stopped. So. I was, after we beat them, I was thinking about that, man. And, and uh, you know, we were shaking everybody's hands, and I said, well, here's a chance, man, to eat all that food to get back. <laughs> <laughs> um, you and uh, Sonny did an amazing job. Yeah, you know what? I I remember I think I had, like, 12 points maybe. I was struggling a little bit early, I think. But all you guys were playing so well, so... Um, that helped out a lot, man. But Creighton, there would, you know, you think about them. We used to kind of push them over a little bit our first couple of years. And, you know, Gallagher and Harstead had become pretty tough over time. So, you know, it got a little bit harder, you know, playing. Well, you and, them, but. and you and Sonny, Drod, you and Sonny had the responsibility of, of, of Gallagher. And Scott and I had Harstead. And you held Gallagher to 6.6 rebounds for that entire game. That is impressive, right? Yeah, but you because know what? That's, John, that's always a team effort, man. You know, those guys are hard to <laughs> stop, man. 
And oh, I, I think we did. I think we did a really good job of helping each other out a lot, you know, absolutely. during that. So, you know, with us, it's always been like that. So, you know. Yeah, but you guys did an amazing job because on Harstead, right, uh, Scott and I were all, you know, Bender's like, okay, you got to keep him from getting another 20 points because he had 20 <laughs> points at halftime, right? Yeah. And and we did. I held him to 14 in the second half, and they, you know, if he would have gotten another 20, we would have lost. And so... <laughs> so, <laughs> but you know that year he was just playing so well. I mean, oh, he, God, he put was. on a lot of weight, uh, muscle weight. You know, and, absolutely. You know, it, it was almost like dealing with a Jerry Jones type man. Okay, yeah, yeah. You know, he was so hard to stop because he was so strong. So, you know, that's uh, you know, with, with guys like that, as you can remember, it's always a joint effort, man. You can't. Uh, there, there was not one of us. You know, I, I can't stop anyone without you guys coming to help out and, you know, cutting cutting off their, you know, driving lane or whatever the case may be or vice versa. So, yeah, so I, we that's one thing that we were really good at. And I think we were better than anyone in the conference at playing help defense. So I think a lot of that attributed to a lot of our success defensively people individually because a lot of times that just <laughs> sometimes that wasn't working <laughs> man, <you know? laughs> so speaking of that talk to playing you know in today's game guys play one two maybe three seasons together we spent four solid years summers you know fall winter christmas break we saw each other every day, three or four times a day. We stayed in the hotels together. We sat in the lobby. And for those that were a little older, could sneak some beer in, Mike get some beer. Otherwise, we played spades all the time. I mean, so talk about that, playing with somebody for four years like that. You know what? We were talking about this <clears throat> a couple of days ago, and I'll say some of the same things. I think that was the difference. And I'm just going to not so much – college basketball in general I'll talk just about ISU um, that was the difference in us being successful and a lot of these other teams down there as of recent because you know of course you, most of us or all of us get Twitter feeds or whatever you know about guys that are coming in to state to play or whatever and these guys are there for a year and they leave maybe two years so you don't have a chance to bond uh, you don't have a chance to get settled into a system. You know, you're constantly replacing the parts. And in my opinion, you can't build that camaraderie that you'll need to be successful, you know, down the road because you didn't. Now, it's not so much that you didn't put the work in. That's not the case. But it's, you don't have the you don't have the guys that'll stick that out for whatever reason. I don't know. You know, they could have a better right. opportunity so I'm not going to knock them or anything like that but I think that was the difference between us and a lot of those uh, teams down there as of recent you know maybe if those guys can stick together for three or four years you know maybe the outcome is a little bit different you know maybe they play a little bit better but you don't get a chance to know your teammates or play long enough with your teammates and I don't know, I mean, personally, I don't know how you can be successful in a setting like that. So, and like, you know, like we were saying, we basically grew up together for four years. Absolutely. We we're each other's parents and all that other craziness. So, I was telling the, I was telling the story uh, the other day at work. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, my father has passed away. Um, and so... And I know your dad is right. And so, right. but I can remember they used to put your dad and my father like front row. <laughs> yeah, I remember. And here's your dad. My dad was 6'6", 350. Your dad was 6'6", 350-ish. Yeah, like 330, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, they were, they were, yeah, and so <laughs> extra seats for those two. <laughs> the number of times I would see them, if you got fouled or I got fouled, both of those men standing up 
stepping onto that concrete floor and yelling at the refs at the top of their lungs. I, I was always worried that they, those two were just going to go kill some referees, right? Because <laughs> if they were disrespecting you and I, it just didn't. And it didn't matter if it was you or I. I mean, they were both defending, right? And, and I, again, I got another story. We were at you, uh, Loyola, and I was telling JC, we're sophomores, we got posterized. I shouldn't say that out loud. <laughs> But that's, I mean, that's like you said, that's we cut our teeth together, right? I mean, that was us in the in the post. And so, yeah. Kind of just, okay, that's what happened. Let's block this out as fast as we can and, you know, get over something else. But our dads, man, my dad was like that anyway. He'll just complain to the referees just because he wants to. And then he'll complain <laughs> to me about what I did or what I didn't do after the game or whatever. Yeah, yeah, but you yeah. know, the, the weird, I don't know what your dad used to do, but my dad would sit there and we were playing. It was a weekend game, might have been Indiana State, possibly. But he's sitting there. I finally noticed that he would sit there with headphones on. So I'm like, I asked after the game, I said, Dad, what are you listening to? Um, you know why the game's going on. He says, well, I love to watch the game, but I'll listen to Dick Lucky <laughs> while oh, yeah. you guys are playing. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was wild. That was wild. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we've hit the uh, Southern game. You, uh, we talked, we said we were going to do a little Donawall talk. You want to do that or you want to talk about Michigan? Yeah, we could talk Donawall. I don't, whatever, yeah. But uh, this is your, this is you. What do you want to talk about next? Oh, yeah. You know what? I will go all the way back to when he was recruiting me. And he came to the house and, you know, he talked to my parents a lot beforehand. Not a lot, but he talked to them a few times. And he finally had come to the house. And, um... You know, saying all these nice, wonderful things, man. I just thought this was the nicest guy in the world, you know, <laughs> shaking our hand. And, yeah, we look forward to getting you down there, blah, blah. But like, yeah, okay. You know, I'm all excited, man. And I'll never forget the first day of practice. But that, that wasn't a nice date uh, <laughs> after that. Once you, know, once, once you get settled in, you, you think about that stuff, but. I remember the first day of practice, we started 2.30, of course, and I walked on the court at 2.25. That was my first strike. So, yeah, he gave it to me. I'm like, damn, I'm here five minutes early. I guess that wasn't good enough. <laughs> so it was you guys that told me. I think it was you or somebody, you and Sanders maybe. Hey, Derek, Big D. Said, no, you can't come here. You can't come here 10 or 15 minutes early. That's late. So, all right, lesson learned. So I remember then we were scrimmaging, and of course they had us on the red team or whatever the you know how that works. So I'm in there, and me and Hollyfield are going up for a rebound, and I'm fighting with them, and I'm so proud of myself in this quick <laughs> moment that you know I'm in here mixing it up, man. He snatches the ball from me and elbows me right in my mouth and knocks me down. <laughs> So I remember Donald Wall stopping practice, and he runs over there. I said, oh, yeah, he's going to kick his ass out of here for that. What's wrong with him? <laughs> Coleman, Chicago, get up off the floor and get out here and play defense. I'm like, hey, you just see what this man did to me, man. You know, so, yeah, I had a – that first year was rough, man. I, honestly, and I didn't tell anybody, but December I called my parents. I said, I need to come home to get an abuse in practice. I'm like, I didn't know basketball was like this. I said, I'll go to the Army or something. I don't care. <laughs> like, Yo, you can't come home. You know? you know the scenario about me, Randy, and Ricky getting in trouble. Oh, I didn't know if you were going to go down this path. Yeah. All right, I, I, I'm yeah, ready for this one. Why not, man? Why not? So, well, not yeah. <laughs> so we had some recruits come in. One kid from Whitney Young, another kid from somewhere else, I forget. <laughs> We're responsible for these guys, so we're taking them out and about, blah, blah, blah. So we decided to go and drink a little bit Saturday night, and we left them in the lobby all night long. Oh. <laughs> what lobby? Yeah, the Waterston lobby. Thank you. That's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> so we left them there, man. I was like, oh, my God, where the recruits at? <laughs> I walked called us, man. So it was like walking through a... a Hall of Purgatory or something, man. I know it's going to be bad. 
<laughs> oh, he's in there <laughs> reaming us about leaving a recruit. And you remember the story about the alcohol? He said, you guys were drinking a bottle of, he said, I think it's vodka. He said, I thought it was whiskey. Yeah. Was vodka. He said, you guys were drinking a bottle of vodka about this big. How big was the sport? And was like, it was about this big, Coach. Like, he's in there talking to alcohol. I'm not an alcoholic, man. Yes, you are. <laughs> he's throwing stuff, man. I'm like, oh, my God, man. And then he suspended us. And I'm thinking, God, I'm getting ready to get myself kicked out of school. Because they printed an article on that from my home newspaper. So, <laughs> yeah, you can imagine the stories that were going on back at home, man. So, my, you know, he gets my parents on the phone, and they're yelling at me. And my dad's threatening to send me off somewhere, man. And I'm like, dude, man, <laughs> I'm just going to sit here and lay low, but... Yeah, that that was an experience. I will say this: there's a silver lining in everything. One thing I learned from him was um, not making excuses or trying to come up with excuses for not working hard. Great. Um, learned a lot about accountability. So I believe it or not, in all of his craziness. I learned a lot of my toughest life lessons from him. I'll on to that story with in JC. So we're up in the conference room on a Sunday, and he calls everybody in, and, and, and he's like, and, and Ricky and Randy and JC, they had a bottle. And, of course, like he said, they stretched the bottle out so big. Right. <laughs> so we're all piled into this conference room, right? And it's 15 of us, and we're big human beings, right? And so there's John in the room. So we're sitting against these chairs, and Sonny's sitting right next to me, and I got Randy, or um, I got uh, um, Derek Sanders sitting on the other side of me, Big D. And uh, Sonny leans over to me and goes, well, damn, well, we got to find out where they got that big bottle of vodka. <laughs> <laughs> so, I went, <laughs> so I start to laugh. Well, I think coach doesn't see it. I, I, I've gotten away with it. Oh, Everybody leave. You know, you're not to talk to Ricky. You're not to talk to Randy. Or you're not, or not to talk to JC. You don't talk to them. They're suspended. Blah, blah, blah. And I think you're only suspended for like three or four weeks. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're, I'm, and, and Gerard will attest. The minute they said exit, you put your head down. You didn't make eye contact with anybody. You got out. Right. I mean, <laughs> you left as soon as possible and I'm leaving. And he's like, Pemberton, stick around. And so, you know, I, he's like, so you think it's funny. They had a bottle of vodka. Go get your running shoes on and see how funny you think that is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're wrapping up. Last story, big man. Michigan. Let's end on a good one. How do you, I did a small interview with Dan Rohn um, before we left, <clears throat> and he was asking, you know, you guys are playing Michigan, blah, 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 it's a big game, and you're, you know, seated, whatever, I can't remember what, I know it's a low seed. 12, we're 12. And he's like, well, how do you feel? I said, you know what, we go in the Valley Conference. I said, I think we have a pretty good conference, and they put their stuff on just like we do. We're going to go out there and play and, you know, see what happens. So fast forward to the Michigan game. So we're playing, and I remember they, after a while, they jumped out on us pretty good, right, in the middle of the second half. I think they went up double digits at one point. And then we fought back. I could be wrong, but I know they had a nice lead, and I remember us, fighting like hell to come back and tie the score. And at that point, I I literally believed that we were getting ready to beat them. Agreed. And so we were ready, man. But, you know, the sports guys sometimes don't. <laughs> <laughs> they don't always cooperate. And you have, you know, I remember they scored a bass that they went up 74-72. And then that god awful Sean Higgins, man, and I don't know how he played on somebody's NBA team. I'm I'm thinking this dude is absolutely atrocious. And he hits <laughs> he hits that weird shot with like was a minute or two left or something like that. 
Yep. And for me, that just took all the air out of me. Yeah, I was just really just trying to get through the rest of the game at that point. That was for me. But, man, we were down there, John, me, you, who else? It was just us. Who else was rebounded? Scott rebounded okay, did not the paint, man. Yeah. And I was like, Terry Mills, dude, this is as good as I thought he was. But, yeah, Lloyd bought shit. I mean, what do you do, man? A man's arms are the same size as your legs. <laughs> <laughs> man can't even tuck his chest hair in his damn jersey, man. <laughs> like this dude, man. It's like Thanos down here. <laughs> <laughs> they had six NBA players on that team. All right, big man. Again, thank you so much, Gerard, for joining us. No, um, thank you, was... man. You know, John, I'll do anything for you, man. I know. I know. So, You're my yeah, boy, we'll man. Do more podcasts or whatever. Senior. Uh, we'll Donna Rose, 52. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll, in, we'll, we'll invite you back. So we are going to wrap this up. This is episode three. Uh, my boy, Gerard Coleman. Uh, it was an honor and a pleasure to play next to him and uh, get a Valley Championship and go to the tournament and play in two NITs. And so, John Diner, Mr. Engineer, will you take us out? <laughs> <laughs>